Okay, so uh, in this lecture, we get a three for one deal. We're covering David Hume, Immanuel Kant, and John Stuart Mill. So the first one, David, David Hume, um, is part of what we call skepticism, which means to bring doubt, and irrationalism, which believes that reason is either overrated or that reason plays a smaller role in things, right? That there's more to human beings than just reason. Um, and we'll kind of talk about that immediately. Um, David Hume points out that thus far, and you'll see this throughout the class, most of Western ethics has argued that the power of reason is the means by which we're supposed to arrive at moral at the moral good. Um, that, that moral judgment is um, something that reason should be responsible for. We saw it with uh, Plato, for sure, Aristotle, for sure. Um, to some extent, we saw it with uh, Augustine. We definitely saw it with Aquinas. So there's this idea in the West that you know we should be rational when it comes to making moral decisions. And David Hume says this is wrong for several reasons. Um, the first thing he points out is that if you look carefully at how you make moral decisions, a close examination exposes that reason is not capable of forcing its moral decisions upon the rest of the person. Right? People usually think rationally one thing and then go and do the opposite. Therefore, reason has no force of compunction upon decision-making. In other words, reason has no way of forcing you to follow through on that decision. Therefore, right, it's it, at best a silent observer in the decision-making process. Next bullet, Hume points out that reason can be and often is used to justify even the most immoral of decisions. Right? Um, in other words, uh, and the reason really kind of can't be trusted to be good. It's been used repeatedly not only to come up with excuses for why you do bad things, but it actually helps you plan out how to do the bad things themselves. So the reason not only cannot force us to do good, often it can't even be used to find out what good is. And so he tells, David Hume tells us in the end, reason only works in two ways when it comes to moral decisions. One, it justifies or excuses the moral decision, right? It explains to yourself why this is the right way to go after you've already made the decision by other means. And two, it's used to design a plan or method of getting the results that you're after, right? So, in other words, the reason doesn't actually make the decision morally, and it doesn't actually convince you to do the, the decision morally. Uh, in fact, once you already made the decision, that's when the reason comes in. The reason comes in to, one, help you get what you want, and two, come up with excuses for why you deserve what you want. Right, um, and so obviously reason isn't really responsible for moral choices. Uh, Hume points out that moral decisions often have more to do with feelings of right and wrong. Right, like if you think about it, you feel something is right, or you feel something is wrong, according to Hume. That means that decisions of morality and feelings of right and wrong have more to do with the passions than they'd have to do with reason. Right? Here he's directly going against people like Plato, obviously. Um, Hume tells us there are two types of passions. There are weak passions. These are like feelings, emotions, and impulses that do not overwhelm you. They're kind of always running in the background. Um, on a regular basis 
uh, and basically they're meant to keep you alive, right? So self-interest, hunger, thirst, self-preservation, right? The desire for comfort so that you can sleep and rest, right? These are part of the weak passions. They're always there. They keep your lungs breathing because you want to stay alive, right? But this is not like the fight or flight instinct. Fight or flight is more of a strong passion, right? These are short-lived but incredibly intense feelings, emotions, and impulses that often can but do not always overwhelm the weak passion. Examples of these intense feelings, fight or flight, in the presence of danger, rage, lust, greed, desire for vengeance, right? Um, outrage. These are part of the strong passions, right? And so, uh, you know, according to Hume, you know, on a, uh, on an everyday basis, mostly your, your weak passions are in charge, right? They keep you breathing, they keep you eating, they keep you drinking, they keep you sleeping, they, they, they pull you away from the edge when cars are coming, you know, su super kind of like basic maintenance, ongoing things going on in you. And then every once in a while, you know, something stimulates you, you see somebody that you're hot for, you see somebody uh, who is doing something terrible to somebody innocent and weak that can't defend themselves, you see somebody kind of hurt your feelings and it, it upsets you, right? Those are the strong passions. They kick in for a little bit and often they can kind of take over your behavior, but they don't always take over your behavior, right? Because as angry as you get, you don't grab them by the head and smash them on the table because your weak passion wants to, you know, the part of you that wants to kind of not be in jail, right, is still kind of in control. That's a weak passion. It's ongoing, right? But it's, you know, consistent enough to overwhelm the strong passion in you that wants to go around hurting people, right? So weak versus strong. Don't be fooled by the names. Strong doesn't always win, right? Among these passions then, uh, Hume points out, there must be something like a moral sense, right? There's a passion in there somehow that's responsible for producing feelings of right and wrong, right? And uh, this, he calls it a moral sense, or he also calls it sympathy, right? And this is where we get our morality from. And so for Hume, that morality, right, that sense of sympathy, that feeling for others, is based on imagination, experience, and concern for others, right? Uh, your ability to kind of uh, take what you've felt in the past from your own experiences and use your imagination to kind of project those feelings onto others so that you can imagine what it feels like for them causes you to feel something for them. You feel sympathy, and that's why you want to do good or you want to help them out, or at the very least, you don't want to do bad to them, or you don't want to do evil to them, right? And so, it's you, you, the, the better your ability to imagine what they're going to feel, the better your ability to care for them enough to not do things that will hurt them. And that's why some people um, are, you know, as he points out in the next bullet, some people have, more, you know, a more developed moral sense these are what we call mo models of moral behavior. Think of your heroes. Think of your saints. And some people have less developed moral sense. Think of, you know, villains and scumbags. And so some people are gifted in the moral sense, just like some people can see better than others. Some people can hear better than others. Some people can smell better than others. Some people can feel morality better than others. And at the end, David Hume concludes that this moral sense that he calls sympathy, right, that some people have better developed than others, provides the basis of our moral decisions and judgments, right? 
um, this is why you get involved politically in something when you get upset, right? It, it, you know, if you, you make a moral decision that you're not going to stand for it, then you get involved in order to bring it to an end. So notice it has more to do with these passions than it does with a reason that calculates uh, what the best judgment should be. Um, and that cl concludes David Hume's theory. Now, of course, as soon as he writes that, you know, he's putting doubt about the role of reason. You have a bunch of rationalists pop up trying to defend it. Uh, and in particular, uh, we, we, we're going to start off with Immanuel Kant, who's a German. Hume was Scottish, by the way. Um, so Immanuel Kant uh, is a German. He's a rationalist. This means that he believes that reason is the source of truth and goodness in human beings. Yes, he's writing during the Age of Enlightenment when the scientific revolution is happening. Um, and um, I'm trying to think of the title for this book. Um, basically, it's on... on uh, Actually, I have to Google that. I can't remember. It's been a while since I've read it, but uh, I, I think it has some. It, it says something like uh, on moral judgment. Critique? No, not critique. Um, ah, on the metaphysics of morals. That's the title. I finally remembered. So this book is called on the metaphysics of morals, and he's a rationalist, as I mentioned. So let's jump into his lecture. So Kant tells us that um, the moral good should be something that is good in itself. In other words, something that is incapable of being used for something wrong or unjust or evil or bad, right? If something is a moral good, it should be something that is good, period. Not something that can be mis, uh, misused. And so out of all the human goods, he tells us in the next bullet, Right? Human goods include strength, health, beauty, charisma, wealth, power, confidence. Right? These are things we call good. Um, Kant points out that only a purely good will or acting out of moral duty meets the criteria of something that is morally good that cannot be used for evil. Right? If you're strong, you can bully people. If you're healthy, you can bully people, right? Think of healthy people who are not that strong, but they still kind of like make fun of people who are sick. If you're beautiful, you can be vain. If you're charismatic, you can become a you know, cult leader or a political leader that leads to terrible things like Hitler, who was extremely charismatic. Intellect can lead to cunning, right? And manipulation of those who are not as smart as you. Wealth can lead to greed. Power can lead to lust, right? And so notice that all of these things that we call good um, can be misused for evil. And that's why Kant says, it's only somebody who has a purely good will, right? That, that good will is the ultimate moral good. Now, what exactly does he mean by a purely good will? He tells us in the next bullet, a purely good will is a 100% sincere effort to do what is right just because it is right. It is choosing the good out of disinterestedness. In other words, without like with zero self-interest. There's nothing you get out of it. You only do it because it's right, right? You don't even get a high five. You can't write it off on a tax break nothing not even a thank you right that desire for good right that that desire to do what is right for the sake of it being right that is the one thing that is purely good for Kant now how do we determine if our, our judgments and decisions are being made this way out of a purely good will he points out in the next bullet that uh, you know we cannot measure this purely good will or moral duty based on intentions or consequences, right? 
You can't go based on your intentions, right? Oh, I wanted to do what was right. Oh, I wanted to help. Because often we lie to ourselves about our intentions. Oh, I would have, but. I could have, but, right? We want to be good in our own minds. And so we give ourselves better intentions. And we often kind of ignore those evil intentions that we have in our actions. So because we lie to ourselves, we can't really rely on what we claim are our intentions. Second, we can't rely on the consequences of our actions because we cannot control the outcomes of our actions, right? Once we make a choice, what happens as a result of a consequence or effect of that choice is often out of our hands. We have no control how people are gonna react. We have no control whether it winds up being successful or not. We have no control over whether um, you know, it was, it only led to good consequences, right? Um, you know, think of like throwing a stone into the, a pond and it has a ripple effect, right? You can't stop the ripple effect at like two ripples. Same thing here. Consequences are out of our control. So intentions and consequences can't really be used to measure the goodness uh, of, of someone's will or the purity of their intention, uh, of their intention, or the or their whether they're disinterested or not, right? And so Kant tells us that we must rationally identify a way of testing disinterestedness and moral duty, independent of intentions or outcomes. And he calls this test the categorical imperative, right? So notice what's in red here: the categorical imperative is a test to determine if your choices are being made without self-interest. If you pass it, that means you made a morally good choice. If you fail it, that means that, not that you're a terrible human being, but that self-interest was involved in your choice. Therefore, you did not choose out of moral duty. That's what it's looking for. So, um, what exactly is the test, right? So when you're either about to make a choice or just finish making a choice, right? The categorical imperative has some questions you need to ask for yourself. Question number one, would you will the principles or maxims behind your moral choice into a universal law of nature? In other words, like the, the thinking that you did to make a decision, if you became like a god, would you take that kind of thinking that you used, would you turn that into a universal law of nature that all people would follow universally like an instinct, right? Like if you could make it into an instinct of human behavior that applied to all people in all circumstances, would you? If the answer is yes, then you pass the first part of the test. So far, no self-interest. However, if your answer is no, uh, or you start coming up with exceptions to the rule, or you come up with a could, or a should, or a would, or a maybe, or a possibly, you fail, right? In other words, it has to be a perfect yes. As soon as you start trying to rationalize stuff, that should be a dead giveaway self-interest was involved. Now, often in class, students don't understand this yet, even with my explanation. It usually helps to get an example. So, if you were, say, walking down a path, right, in a natural wooded area or a park, and you hear a splash, and someone that is, you know, struggling with the current in the river, right? And they look like they're gonna drown. Would you help by any means necessary, right? The answer is yes. Okay, so far so good. However, would you, let's say you, you answer is yes, right? I'm gonna help. If that yes, right, how you got to that yes? 
is something you would make sure would apply to everybody everywhere at all times under sing similar circumstances, would you still keep it a yes, right? So for example, um, yes, I would, I would help them by any means necessary because uh, I'm a very strong swimmer, right? Okay, would you take that way of thinking and make it universally true? Everybody else only participates in helping someone when they happen to be good at that thing that they need help with? They only try to save lives when they're good, right? Would you still make that a universal truth? Um, for example, uh, if your little brother or your little sister, um, or if you have a little son or daughter, if they're drowning, would you still make it that the people on the side only help if they are strong swimmers? Right? Now, if you say yes, because I don't want them risking, even for somebody I love, right? So far, so good, right? But those of you who start coming in going, well, no, they should jump in even if they're not good. That's a little kid. They should be trying everything. Then the same thing would have been true for you. If that was your loved one, you would have wanted the, yourself to jump in no matter what, right? Even if you weren't related to them. So the point here is that, like, when we start coming up with exceptions to rules that we follow, that's because self-interest is involved in the decision. That means our decision is not purely moral. It is not purely good. Self-interest is infecting that decision. Now, if you pass the first part, that doesn't mean you're off the hook. You still have to pass the second part. So the second question of the categorical imperative. Are those involved in your moral decision treated as a means to an end or an end in themselves, right? In other words, are they being treated as a tool or obstacle or are they being treated as the whole point of the decision in the first place is to help them for the sake of them, right? That's what it means by means to an end or an end in themselves. Are you helping them because of you know, just to help them? Or are you helping them because you hope to get something out of it? Right? So, if you're treating people as a tool or an obstacle, you fail. If, however, you treat them as, like the whole point of the interaction is then, because they are worthy, then you pass. Right? Notice, you have to pass both to pass this test. If you pass both, that means that your choice was made without self-interest. You acted purely out of what was right. You had a morally good decision. Then you passed Kant's test. Now, if it seems like no one would pass this test, that's untrue. If you take like the passive resistance of Gandhi or Martin Luther King Jr., that would pass this test. Because if you ask them, would they make this into a universal law of nature that all people had to be passive when engaging people in political disagreement? They would say yes, 100%. And if you ask them, are the people involved an end in themselves or a means to an end, they would tell you, you know, the people they're trying to help are an end in themselves. The law enforcement officials that they're running against are an end in themselves. The soldiers are an end in themselves. The whole point of passive resistance is not to engage in violence because you know that the person in front of you that you're fighting or shooting or stabbing is not really the real problem anyway, right? They are human beings who are just trying to make their way in the world like everybody else, earn a paycheck, right? So notice Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr., would pass both parts of Kant's categorical imperative. They would ask everybody to follow the same rules and everybody involved, including their enemies, are treated as an end in themselves, not as an obstacle to be removed, right? So there are people who would pass this test. Now, another kind of rationalist trying to argue against Hume is John Stuart Mill. 
Uh, not only is he what we call a utilitarian, that's the title of his book, Utilitarianism. Right? We'll see what that means in a, in a second as we move forward in the lecture. Basically, what Mill points out is that what is labeled as morally good is often associated with some sensation of pleasure, right? Something has a, a sensation of pleasure, and we call it good. Good ice cream, good pizza, good pizza, right? Um, you know, good sex, right? Uh, a, a good painting, a good song. So, not only is aesthetically good associated with pleasure, notice he says morally good is associated with pleasure. When we see somebody do good, we get pleasure from it. When people, t you know, when we even if people don't recognize what we did was morally good, we get a pleasure from our own morally good decisions, right? We become proud of ourselves. So, notice there's a sense of pleasure associated with goodness, no matter what type of goodness we're talking about. Notice, Mill points out, however, that humans are complicated and we're composed of mind and body. Therefore, the sources of pleasure are not simply physical pleasure and physical objects like sex and eating and drinking. He says, there are many things humans require that are necessary goods that have a sense of pleasure that go above and beyond the physical, right? We have aesthetic pleasure. We have intellectual pleasure. We have social pleasure, right? So things like stability and companionship and affection, love, right? Uh, wisdom, art. These also are sources of pleasure besides just like eating, drinking, and sex, right? Because we're human. We're complicated. So moving on to the next bullet at the top there, uh, Mill tells us that um, be, this kind of really emphasizes the social phenomenon within human existence and how we need to be able to share what we call good with other human beings. Um, otherwise, we are not able to fully like enjoy them. Therefore, in the next bullet, whatever is morally good has to be that which maximizes pleasure and minimizes pain, not only for me, but for the greatest number of people around me, right? And so this is where we get to the definition of the good for Mill, right? What is morally good is that which maximizes pleasures and minimizes pain for the greatest number of people. That is what is good. And so in the next bullet, he tells us, there is a calculus, right? There's a uh, e math mathematical equations we have to perform in a way when it comes to moral choices because there's always going to be some people left out, right? And we try to, we need to try to reduce that number as much as possible um, so that that way this, the sacrificial number is as small as possible for the greater good, right? For the majority. Um, this kind of way of thinking, right, where we're willing to sacrifice a couple of people for more people, right, is perhaps the oldest and most widespread, sorry, it's the oldest and most widespread form of moral philosophy, all right? Out of all the, all the stuff we're covering this semester, this is the one that, like, has been inside of us since we were still, like, before Homo sapiens, right? When we were Homo Neanderthalus, Homo erectus, or whatever other form of primate we were, we were already utilitarian, right? We've seen this in primates. They are utilitarian. They make decisions and choices. It is also widespread. It's the stuff we use this to make our decisions in families, in classes, in teams, in militaries, in businesses, right? We calculate how much is it going to cost, how many people will be hurt by it, how many people will benefit from it. And if it's big enough, we go for it, right? Um, even though this is the oldest form of moral philosophy, and even though it's the most widely used form of moral philosophy, it also dehumanizes, right? It, it, the people we're willing to sacrifice for the greater good, 
right? We dehumanize them. Instead of recognizing the loss, right, we, we refer to them as collateral damage, acceptable loss, necessary risk, right? Um, and so Mill is giving us something, uh, a, a, an accurate description of how we make moral decisions, but I'm not so sure that this is how we should be making moral decisions. I don't know if that makes sense. It's something to think about. All right. Um, this concludes this lecture on Hume, Kant, Mill. All right. I'll see you in the next lecture. Bye.